Hi there, and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast. And today I'm working from um, a brilliant book I've been sent by IB Taurus, World War I in Central and Eastern Europe, Politics, Conflict and Military Experience. It's a collection of essays that seeks to be, be part of this task that I'm really interested in, in rebalancing our perspectives of the First World War. Um, an Anglo-centric view of things, which inevitably um, a historian, a history teacher like myself has grown up with and uh, and kind of perpetuates really, is that of the, the Western Front. But if you consider that n- um, not only was the, uh, the, the Western Front only a small portion of the overall fighting in the First World War, but that a far bigger front was that between Austria, Germany uh, and Russia. And that because of the collapse of the Central Powers and Russia and the Ottoman Empire, violence continues uh, within the uh, eastern portion of Europe and the, um, the Middle East uh, up until 1923 and even slightly beyond um, due to the development, the emergence of successor states, and uh, the fighting between those. It, it makes for an incredibly uh, dramatic and, and um, detailed and, and fascinating uh, part of the world uh, that once again is plunged into uh, violence, uh, into enormous bloodshed um, uh, from 1939 onwards uh, as the uh, new boundaries uh, and new borders are once again torn up by Hitler. The, those that are created um, at uh, the Treaty of, of at the Paris Peace Conference and the various treaties that emanate from that. Anyway, the thing that I'm going to look at today is a, a fascinating essay called "The Failed Quest for Total Surveillance," and this is a discussion of how uh, Austria-Hungary spied upon it, not only its own people um, but also uh, on subversion during the war. This is an essay written by the historian Mark Lewis, and the uh, the interesting thing for me is the means by which the security state of the Austro-Hungarian Empire emerged. If you look at the the means by which the the modern British security state I- emerged prior to the First World War, it was based around um, the insecurities of empire, the fear that the British Empire was uh, going to be undermined by uh, Germany, by naval rivalries and um, uh, the spying on, on naval secrets uh, and the building of German dreadnoughts. And uh, the, this ang- these anxieties brought about MI5 and uh, MI6. And the, the significance of that is that obviously the navy was the means by which, the, kind of the glue by which the British Empire is held together. Now, intelligence um, and counterintelligence, espionage and internal security all roll into one in the case of the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, and even before it became the Austro-Hungarian Empire after the uh, defeat of 1866. Um, there was a robust and growing security culture uh, all the way since uh, the, the revolutions of uh, 1848. The glue that held the Austro-Hungarian Empire together is, is obviously the state, and the state becomes under increased pressure throughout the 19th century and into the 20th from the demands of uh, liberal and then not so liberal nationalism. And these were the forces that um, the intelligence and security state within the Austro-Hungarian Empire tried to uh, tried to stamp out these uh, forces that were likely to tear the empire apart. Um, the part of the context of that, for those that aren't students of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, is a, is a multi-ethnic land empire. So it incorporated. Um, Austrians, Hungarians, Romanians, Ruthenians, uh, Poles, Czechs, Croats, um, and uh, other nationalities uh, under the uh, Habsburg throne, uh, and then later uh, the dual monarchy after 1866. And because of this, nationalism was an existential threat 
to the Austro-Hungarian Empire and threatened to dissolve it from within. So um, by the time the First World War begins, generations of secret policemen had already been uh, active in preventing this from happening. During the First World War, the uh, Austrian military, uh, and Hungarian of course, were vehemently opposed to all sources of, of nationalist politics. They um, had gone to war, really, as the result, as they saw it, of extremist nationalist politics, the assassination uh, of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, and nationalist politics had been uh, nothing but uh, a source of consternation and trouble for the empire since the 1840s. The empire had had two major defeats inflicted upon them by France and by uh, Prussia uh, as a result of nationalist um, uh, nationalist movements in uh, Piedmont and in Germany and it's hard it's not hard to see why uh, nationalism as a concept was uh, an unpleasant uh, notion to those in in the metropole in, uh, in in Vienna Mark Lewis writes Austria was a European innovator in the creation of a higher poli- higher state police a residence registration system and the implementation of enlightened social policy in which the centralizing state supervised its officials and reported on the mood of the people. Johann Anton Graf von Pergen created the higher state police in the 1780s and expanded the residence registration system. During the Metternich era, police minister Count Sadlinski expanded the system, creating networks of confidential informers to watch secret uh, his nationalist organisation in the Habsburg's Italian lands and partitioned Poland as well as suppress the spread of German nationalism and republicanism by using censorship, arrests, restrictions on university enrolments and travel bans. Though some aspects of the system were dismantled after 1848-49, the Habsburg Empire, Austria's first republic, and the Austro-Fascist corporate state all maintained a central office that kept files on politically suspicious people. So, as you can see, throughout the 19th century, Austria was holding back the tide of nationalism and using state surveillance in order to do it. These traditions continued throughout the First World War and into the interwar period. But it's the First World War chiefly that we're interested in today. In about 1913, uh, as a response to the increased pressures of Italian nationalism, the Italian uh, state wanting the Irredentalands along the Dalmatian coastline uh, of Croatia. Uh, Pan-Slav nationalism, centering mainly uh, around Serbia uh, and greater Serbian nationalism. Um, The policing of nationalities uh, transformed. Um, The political bureau of the Vienna police direction began to cooperate with military intelligence, combining domestic surveillance with counter-espionage because domestic uh, concerns, the domestic uh, nationalist agitation, was intimately connected with um, overseas powers. It was Russia that was a a principal force behind uh, Serbian nationalist and Slavic nationalist agitation in the Balkans, for example. So the two worked hand in hand. This is a a development in intelligence history that you see throughout the world at different stages throughout the 20th century, that uh, internal subversion and external espionage um, merge seamlessly, measures against them merge seamlessly into one. Perhaps one way of interpreting that is is, is that it relates on some level to the history of a kind of a more integrated and globalised world that threats to the uh, state never remain or un- uh, within the borders of the state or unconnected to uh, threats further afield. It was fortunate for Austria that this collaboration did happen as it began to uncover some major spy networks uh, within Austria, particularly uh, those that emanated from Imperial Russia, which was ahead of the game um, 
for most of the 19th century compared to nearly every other European power in their sophisticated uh, espionage uh, activities. For evidence of this, uh, everyone should read Adam Butterworth's brilliant book, The World That Never Was, um, about spies and anarchists across Europe in the 19th century uh, and the role that Russian intelligence played in all of that. In May 1914, just before the war began, the Austro-Hungarian uh, Army's Intelligence Bureau, um, the Vienna Police Directorate and the Hungarian Border Police formed a new kind of domestic counterintelligence system in order to keep an eye on suspected spies and suspicious, suspicious individuals. And the main focus of their efforts was, of course, on uh, Russian spies and espionage. Um, and Russian espionage against Austria-Hungary had grown significantly since 1906. Provincial governments had done much of this work since 1910, uh, encouraging police uh, and uh, other organs of the state to keep an eye on uh, individuals, to watch particular installations such as bridges and uh, military camps, um, and to keep the army aware of any seemingly suspicious or uh, unexpected developments. But the uh, central government in Vienna and Budapest were not coordinating these activities. I had to wait until uh, 1914. And without any official measures, it was possible for those uh, accused of or convicted of espionage to be expelled from one uh, province and to carry on operating in another before the existence of wartime controls, uh, espionage was not punishable by, by death. A new system was established called the Defensive Kundschaftdienst, uh, which was uh, able to quickly communicate information between the state police uh, and the, the local regions um, and would also engage in spying overseas. Um, Austria-Hungary was a dual monarchy of 60 million and divided into admi four administra administrative areas. Austria, Hungary, Bosnia, uh, and the Kingdom of Croatia, Slavonia, and Dalmatia. You can kind of see why it was that Franz Kafka uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and um, writers uh, talked about the bureaucratism of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, the whole uh, counter-espionage system was about creating uh, huge amounts of data um, that could be shared uh, across the entire system. Uh, and it meant, obviously, in the pre-computer days, vast amounts of paper being moved around. Um, and it meant that there was a surveillance state in, uh, in the development, which meant that not just spies were uh, uh, focused on, or people who were specifically known to be spies, but much of the population uh, was uh, suspect, and there was a kind of a sense of guilt until uh, proven innocence, uh, and that uh, the people of Austro-Hungary uh, would become a supervised uh, civilian population. Now, this is the, really the response to uh, fissile nationalism. This is the kind of the new glue that hopefully will keep the state together, constant vigilance. The First World War saw this system integrated with the, the, the people who, uh, from the postal service who censored mail uh, and uh, existing uh, Austro-Hungarian police forces, which also had their own detectives uh, and officers to investigate cases of subversion. Investigations um, would sometimes begin because a censor had flagged up some kind of subversive writing um, and would send um, information through to a relevant police uh, officer or uh, investigator. Um, sometimes confidential informants would work for the police uh, and tip off um, them to um, nationalist plots or um, nationalist circles. And then there would also be information from military intelligence um, or the public um, who would report suspicious neighbours. So the system actually becomes overwhelmed with uh, a vast kind of excess, vast surplus 
of information, much as during Nazi Germany, the, um, the zeal and the voluntarism of denunciations actually overwhelmed the Gestapo system so that most of the uh, people who are informed on uh, are, are rarely investigated. And the job of the Gestapo man is merely to sift the denunciations. During the First World War, political policing had fewer limitations upon it. It focused on wider groups of people and there were fewer um, constitutional or legal oversights on uh, police activity. Um, the number of agencies and the number of uh, bureaucratic uh, records dramatically increased and the number of uh, police officers also grew. Um, and the greater of the impacts was on the actual treatment of those who, were, who came under suspicion. Um, the system obviously is in no way near as uh, extreme as uh, the Gestapo or the Stasi in the German Democratic Republic and or the, or the Cheka uh, as emerged in, in Bolshevik Russia. Um, however, there were few methods by which one could appeal against any conviction and a uh, few cases um, in which uh, a person um, who demanded release from detention was actually successful. Um, lawyers were rarely involved, um, normally due to a lack of finance or availability, um, but also um, because one would come from a social class where that really wasn't much of an option. The kinds of people who were accused of um, treason uh, or sedition in poor parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire who had been agitating for, um, the, say for example, the Irredentalans to be transferred to Italy after the First World War. Um, in very rarely were these wealthy, well-heeled individuals. This was kind of nationalism from below. Rarely did those who were uh, engaged in nationalist activities fear the knock at the door from the secret police. Um, they rarely encountered anything that they would recognise as a secret policeman. Normally, if they were arrested, it was by the local or state police um, in um, uniform who would uh, recognise who they would recognise as people uh, commit, uh, carrying out arrests for fairly standard, normal kinds of crime. Interestingly. Various aspects of the Austro-Hungarian uh, secret police system or state, uh, state uh, surveillance system were underfunded. Um, the police force never became all-powerful because of a lack of, of finance. Um, and much of the budget was spent, as mentioned, on uh, the, the national question, disloyal nationalities uh, such as Serbs, Croats, um, Czechs, Ruthenes, Galician Poles and uh, some Italians um, were the main um, draw for the budget of the state, state uh, security apparatus. Poor police files in central offices um, mean that it's difficult to see exactly how many people were uh, investigated but historians over the years have put forward various hypotheses um, as, to, um, as to how many. It's rare, looking through the archives, to find really any or many cases of actual espionage, you know, passing on of secret information, um, things that are decried as espionage, but were often expressions of cultural, um, national identity, speaking or, uh, or writing in uh, Czech or in Slovak or Slovene or Croat or, 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 or what have you, was a way of expressing um, the desire for nationhood, and this itself was seditious. Um, Austrian and Croat police, for example, uh, investigated and interned, uh, interned Serbs in Slavonia um, who uh, were accused of allegedly working for the Serbian secret police. 
Um, they couldn't find any evidence of this claim because it basically wasn't true. And so they simply interned them anyway. And this is really kind of uh, barely concealed prejudices uh, at work. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that being part of a national minority in the later stages of the war made one suspect um, in, uh, by default. For example, uh, the Viennese police um, saw Czech-speaking Moravians as being Russophile or supportive of Russia. Why? Because they refused to contribute to relief efforts for wounded soldiers. Um, supposedly held uh, secret meetings, though this is uh, perhaps doubtful, and wrote graffiti on trains, um, which was more just a general expression of discontent uh, about the war. In one instance, in Moravia, at the town of Prerau, or Predov, as it is uh, known now, um, the Viennese police believed that Slavs in Moravia were fundamentally untrustworthy and were uh, opposed to um, Austria itself. And they perhaps thought this because they saw that the Czechs and Czech nationalists had everything to gain from the downfall of the Austrian Empire. In the case of uh, the Ruthenian national minority, um, in Chernovitz, um, the Ruthenian, uh, Ruthenians from Galicia uh, were arrested and interned. Um, some of these had been active in pro-Russian political parties and newspapers before the war, um, but the Austrian military uh, prosecutors were unable to actually make a case uh, against them of treason but then continued to hold them uh, in garrison arrest, so internment anyway. So if the actual goal of proving a legal case of treason and subversion fell down, you could still keep people in, in uh, indefinite uh, detention uh, anyway. And what that does is it has the uh, effect of suppressing nationalist politics and nationalist uh, agitation, or so the authorities thought. Undoubtedly, these kinds of reactionary and brutal measures do nothing to uh, pour oil on, on troubled waters, um, and it, but it would prevent the opening of Ruthenian schools and generally try to disrupt Ruthenian um, language and, and, and culture from where it was generally believed that politics being sprang from. Much of this behaviour came from the belief that the Austro-Hungarian Empire would win the war, along with Germany, and that the Austro-Hungarian Empire would not break up. So one could treat um, ethnic minorities or national minorities uh, with a degree of repression during the war, um, and at some point after the war, some kind of settlement would be made and the empire would continue as is. It's only in 1918 when it appears that the writing is really on the wall for the empire um, and riots in the cities and mass movements of migrants and chaos and the gradual um, fragmenting of the empire uh, occurs to be sort of concluded with uh, the Paris Peace Conference that the um, estimations of the Austro-Hungarian security state turn out to be, to be wrong. And then it transpires that a great many of the activities, the repressive activities of the um, empire during the war actually fueled the kind of uh, uh, fissile politics, the kind of uh, nationalist aspirations uh, for independence that materialised after the war with the creation of new states such as uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, uh, Yugoslavia and Hungary, and independent Hungary and uh, also uh, a, an enlarged Romanian state. So there is a complicated relationship between state surveillance and uh, national aspirations, one not necessarily successfully suppressing the other. Anyway, I hope you found this useful and I will um, 
perhaps continue with a little bit more on uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire during the war in the next few weeks. Um, and if you can give us any of your uh, attention on our Patreon page, uh, a little bit of support is always, always gratefully received. We fund ourselves on donations and uh, tiny trickle of ad revenue. Uh, and I look forward to speaking to you soon. All the best. Bye-bye.